Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, before I introduce my guest this week, just an announcement about one of our forthcoming locals events. Uh, this time we're going to be in Hull. Uh, that's on Tuesday, October the 24th. Tuesday, October the 24th. If you're in Hull or just around Hull, or indeed if you're not and you're just interested, uh, do come along. Uh, these events now we've been having, we've just had one in um, Manchester, we've had one in Birmingham, uh, most recently we had one in Leeds, hugely successful, many new people, like-minded, and um, we're thrilled with the way they're going. So if you'd like to come, we'll send you details, um, and the best way to do that is if you go to email us at uh, locals at newcultureforum.org.uk, it'll be under this video too and then we can give you the details of when and where. But it is on Tuesday the 24th of October in Hull. Now I'm very pleased that uh, given the appalling events of the past week, my guest today is the editor of the Jewish Chronicle, Jake Wallace Simons. Um, he's also the author of a book which is called Israelophobia, came out in September. Um, you might say that's very timely. Um, one could say it's been timely for the past 70 years. Um, but I'm delighted that he's made the time to come and talk to us about the week's events. Thank you very much, Jay. Pleasure. Um, first of all, uh, we're recording this on Friday the 13th. And there was something put out by, I believe, one of the founders of Hamas that today should be some kind of day of rage or de jihad or whatever. And uh, I just wondered, um, what is it like at the moment for Jewish people in Britain? It's tough. It's tough. I mean, it goes without saying that it's tough uh, because of the events themselves. Uh, everybody in Britain, in the Jewish community, uh, is affected in some way personally by some degrees of separation, whether they have family members who've been killed or kidnapped, or friends, uh, or friends of friends, and so forth. Um, so there's that trauma which has hit everybody around the world and in Britain, but hits Jews harder. Mm. Uh, but then there's the added uh, hardship of feeling unsafe and in danger. Uh, and that has been exacerbated by the shameful sites of pro-Palestinian mm. rallies that have taken place up and down the country, including much support for Hamas. Mm. Uh, there's nothing wrong with a pro-Palestinian rally, but there's something wrong with supporting Hamas. In fact, it's uh, a criminal act. Mm. And in fact, just this afternoon, somebody was arrested in Brighton on suspicion of uh, supporting Hamas at a rally. Um, so that has made Jews feel besieged. Yeah. There have been lots of expressions of support, which are very welcome, particularly from the Prime Minister, the King, the Opposition, mm. uh, Home Secretary, the police. But it's a different matter in the population, mm. and you see that in the media as well. Mm. Uh, so uh, I think for, for most Jews, there's a sort of balancing act between wanting to remain safe yes. and taking those security measures, but at the same time uh, not causing extra fear particularly to children, by too intrusive security measures. I mean, there are kids going to school who are saying, why have we got so many police outside our yes, school? What's yes. going to happen to us? Yeah. Haven't some schools actually closed, closed up for the day? Two schools closed. Mm. Uh, my uh, family have been targeted uh, in different ways. And I say targeted, not with terrorism, but they've been shouted at and things. Really? Um, my nephew was in shouted, the street, at, just in shouted the out in the streets two days ago. My sister, when she was picking up her toddler from nursery, was pursued by a carload of people who shouted at them. Um, so this stuff is, is a daily uh, experience for Jews, unfortunately, mm. at the moment. And uh, anti-Semitic attacks, basically over the past few days? or Well, thank God there hasn't been any of that. There's been no physical uh, violence. Mm. There was a, uh, a, a kosher restaurant that was vandalised uh, early on, on the Sunday, Green, I yes. think, in Golders Green. Mm. But as far as I know, that's more likely a burglary. Uh, although there was graffiti nearby that, 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 prop, that appeared that was uh, uh, to do with Palestine. 
Um, so I think the community is on tenterhooks, not because there have been no physical attacks, but there's a lot of menacing notes in society. There's a sense of not really knowing how much security is enough and how much is too much. Yeah. Yes. Um, you mentioned there the demonstrations. Um, one thing that I've noticed about those is the extraordinary uh, passivity of the police. Um, is this something that worries you? Well, I mean, that has been a problem in the past. In 2021 in particular, during the Gaza conflict mm. then, which doesn't compare in any way to this in scale. Mm. Um, the death toll was 256 Palestinians back then, and so I had 13 uh, people in Israel. Um, during that time, there was a rally of 180,000 people in Hyde Park, um, and other rallies as well outside the Israeli embassy. And that devolved into scenes that we can all recall of a convoy of cars driving through Jewish areas, shouting with megaphones out the window, we're going to rape your daughters. Yes. Um, there was uh, a gang patrolling around the back streets near High Street Kensington, around the embassy, saying, we want the Zionists, we want their blood. And the police walking along in the video alongside them and not responding. Mm -hmm. um, the Home Secretary, when I spoke to her the other day, described that as a failure. Mm. Uh, and she promised zero tolerance. Uh, towards that kind of behaviour this time round. Uh, and I've also spoken to the Deputy Met Police Commissioner mm -hmm. who gave a similar message. And on the streets uh, over the past few days, we haven't seen very much intervention by the police. Uh, there was that arrest that I mentioned this afternoon. Mm. The difficulty is that a Palestine rally is not illegal. And in, in my view, in normal times, it's not morally wrong. Mm. Uh, the Palestinians... People have the right to support the Palestinian cause. They have reasonable arguments. I have no quarrel with that. Mm. Um, but if your instinct upon seeing this medieval savagery and brutality mm. meted out upon Israelis, if your first instinct is to raise the flag of Palestine, mm. it feels like that's an endorsement of that mm. uh, tragedy and that violence. Um, the police, that's not a criminal act. The criminal threshold is support for Hamas. Mm -hmm. That presents the police with a challenge. The challenge is having officers that are specialist enough to recognize that support, mm -hmm. to know one flag from another, to understand Arabic slogans, perhaps. Um, but, you know, some of, the, some of the support has been overt. Mm -hmm. in, in Brighton, there are reports of one woman who, uh, who praised the massacres as beautiful mm -hmm. and said it was a victory. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. This is just unspeakable. I'm sorry, um, but um, I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised or shocked, uh, to be honest, by some of these pronouncements. I mean, whether they are on demonstrations or, or coming from our universities, that's the other thing, isn't it? This is pretty much, you know, colleges and campuses. This is, these are the fellow travellers, aren't they? Yes, I mean, my, my book, as you mentioned, is called mm. Israelophobia, yeah. which is the newest version of the oldest hatred, which yes. is what I, how I term it. Uh, it is anti-Semitism. Mm. But, you know, anti-Semitism has this capacity to pass itself off as a virtue. Mm. And it assumes, it appropriates the moral language of the day in yeah. order to disguise itself. Yeah. So in medieval times, that was the language of Christianity. Yeah. Um, you know, abusing, massacring, expelling, marginalizing, dehumanizing Jews was in some way legitimized by religion because they killed Christ. Mm. And it was God's work in some, mm. in some shape. In the 20th century, it, uh, with the rise of rationalism, it was given the cover of pseudoscience. Jews were an inferior race. They thought, they thought they had to be exterminated for the good of mankind. Mm. It was seen as a, um, or attempts were made to make it be seen as mm. um, a, a righteous cause. Uh, and these days, that's been discredited as well. In the shadow of the Holocaust, racism has become the cardinal sin of our times. And so anti-Semitism has had to move again, and it's moved into politics, uh, and it's expressed as hatred of Jews for their national home. Mm. And if ever anybody was in any doubt about the seamlessness of medieval anti-Semitism, the pogroms of Eastern Europe, the Nazi Holocaust, and current is is Israelophobia, just take a look at the events of the past few days. Yes, You've seen the sharp edge of Israelophobia uh, in the form of the most brutal, m grotesque savagery mm. um, 
of a, of a peace with the violence that's been perpetrated against Jews for centuries, mm -hmm. taking place in 2023 in Israel. Mm -hmm. And you've seen the mania that's gripped the supporters of Palestine mm -hmm. to the extent to which the, 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 the Israelophobia is so powerful that they even condone and support these acts of savagery. Mm -hmm. And one major foothold, as you mentioned, is in universities. Mm -hmm. Universities, they have uh, for years had Israeli Apartheid Week, even though there is no apartheid mm -hmm. in Israel. How can there be an apartheid in a state mm -hmm. where an Arab Supreme Court judge has sentenced a former prime minister to jail for corruption, where the majority of the national football team are Arabs, where Arab heads the country's biggest bank. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet Israel is the only country that is subjected to apartheid week on campus, not China, which incarcerates um, we, the Uyghur Muslim people and yeah. is perpetrating yeah. an actual genocide against them, for example. Uh, not any other country in the world, North Korea that persecutes Christians or any other, only Israel. Um, and that uh, is an example of the double standards and demonization and falsity mm -hmm. of Israelophobia, mm -hmm. uh, which in Britain at least is, is predominantly present on the political left amongst progressives and the further left you go, the more it rears its head. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the bastions of that is universities, but there are many others. Yeah, That's a, a very interesting point that you bring up, because it, obviously uh, anti-Semitism is always characterised as being a far-right thing. And obviously, um, But this is, on the whole, hard left, isn't it? Yes. The, I mean, anti-Semitism in other countries, like in the United States, for example, there is a much bigger far-right scene, if I can yes, call it that. Yeah. Um, and we, we've seen that, uh, you know, with tragic results in the Pittsburgh shooting, mm -hmm. Pittsburgh synagogue shooting, Three of Life shooting, for example. Uh, similar story in Germany and other places. But in Britain, we don't have a significant far-right um, uh, element in society. There's some, and they're dangerous, but they're not many. Um, and so Israelophobia mainly uh, is found on the left. And there are good historical reasons for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, which derive really from the Cold War. Uh, the Soviets... Explain that, that's interesting. Could you just explain that a bit further? Of course. Well, I mean, the Soviets were known, for, uh, among other things, for their extraordinary propaganda apparatus, which was called Active Measures. Mm -hmm. uh, they ran various different propaganda operations, one of which was called Operation Infection, where they tried to accuse the states of being responsible for producing the AIDS virus. And in fact, they were successful at, at one point in getting CBS to report that as, as if it was fact. Really? Um, but another one was, was, uh, was anti-Zionism. Mm. Uh, there was a team of what was called Zionologists in the Kremlin during the Second World War. Sorry, during the Second World War. During the Cold War. I beg your pardon. During the Cold War. Um, and they were responsible for the creation and propagation of all of the Israelophobic myths that infest our society today. So they invented the lies. They invented the idea that Israel is perpetrating a genocide, mm -hmm. even though a single look at the facts. I mean, you know, the Palestinian population has increased fivefold since Israel's birth. That's a pretty inept genocide. Yeah. They invented the idea that it was a white supremacist state, even though more Israelis are non-white than white, that it's a colonial state, even though um, it's quite clearly post-colonial, arising as a, as a result of British partition following the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the withdrawal of the mandate, like other countries, Pakistan and India, Ireland, so. Um, that it's a racist state, uh, even though it isn't, it's an apartheid state. Zionism is racism was one of their slogans. Mm -hmm. All of this was, was created by Kremlin propagandists based on um, the anti-Semitism of the ultra-nationalists of the generation before in Tsarist Russia. Mm -hmm. The reason they did this was because in the Cold War, uh, they supported the Arab world, the Americans supported the Israelis, yeah. so it was a, that was a theatre of, of, of the Cold War. Uh, and they disseminated this stuff uh, with huge resources and energy into the West via newspapers, pamphlets, espionage, mainly through their embassies. Mm -hmm. uh, there were publications in Britain, Soviet Weekly, straight left, mm -hmm. um, were uh, driven by this Soviet stuff. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it was... Um, it was quite blatant. Uh, there was, on one occasion, one of these British papers uh, published a letter that was filled with the grossest and basest Israelophobia. Mm -hmm. 
but they were left red-faced afterwards when they discovered that the person who written it was the head of the National Front. Right. There was a, yeah. a, a French citizen um, uh, who in 1973 was arrested for race hate. He was working for the Soviet embassy in Paris and he published a newsletter that included an essay that was, again, grossly Israelophobic. Mm. It was discovered that what he had done was literally taken uh, a, a, an essay written by the ultra-nationalists, the Black Hundreds mm. from Tsarist times, mm. an anti-Semitic mm. piece of writing, taken out the words Jew, put in the word Zionist instead, and published it. Even the typos were still there. Really? Really? And so the Russians are responsible. Mm. So when you hear all this stuff, mm. people quite easily throw around Israel's an apartheid state, genocide, mm. ethnic cleansing, white supremacy, all the, all the, pr the, the cardinal sins of the social justice movement of the left, of progressives. Um, that all derives from Russian propaganda and is a testament to its success. And these sins are, um, you know, the, the reason that Jews are accused of those is because they can no longer be accused of things they were in the medieval times, such as, you know, you can no longer say that the Jews were, kill, you know, kidnapping Christian children mm. to use their blood in their rituals, mm. but you can say that the Zionists enjoy killing babies and children. Mm. 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 So this, the, the stream of anti-Semitism, the ideas, the, the characteristics of it remain intact, but they're reskinned with new language and new ideas in, to enable the bigotry to pass itself off as a virtue. Yes. Are you frustrated by the sheer, you mentioned the, you know, people just banding these terms around that they've just kind of learnt, been imbibed. Is it a source of frustration to you, the general ignorance of the history of Israel that there is amongst these people? Yeah, I mean, it's funny, there's, um, I suppose the, the, the short answer is yes. Mm. But people, there's something unique about Israel that people feel they know it and they're qualified to talk about it, mm. even if they don't. Mm. And the reason is that, there are, as Saul Bellow wrote, yeah. there are two Israels. Mm. There's the first, which is the Israel of reality, of fact, mm. which is territorially insignificant. Mm. It's, it constitutes a quarter of a percent of the Middle East. Mm. Its population is smaller than London. Mm. Its economy is about the size of Nigeria. Um, uh, the, 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 the total number of people killed in its wars in the last 75 years until last week was 86,000. Mm. By comparison, we killed 200,000 plus in Iraq in three years, mm -hmm. in three years. Mm. Not to mention you know, the partition of India, which happened within months of the Israeli-Palestinian partition killed a million people at least, maybe up to two million. I think in fact, actually someone worked out that proportionately, if you take the amount of people who've died in Israel this week, um, that it would amount to, if you, would, if you were to sort of proportionately uh, work it out, to, to many, many thousands, wouldn't it? I mean, it, 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 you know, when people have said it's 9-11. Yeah, like I mean, the, the proportion of deaths in Israel would be equivalent to about 8,500 people yeah. dead here, yeah. about 45,000 dead in America. Mm, mm, mm. Um, so the, the Israel of fact is that. It's, mm, it's mm. territorially insignificant uh, in terms of human rights abuses and, and deaths and war. Uh, minor on the leagues, on this grim league table. Mm. But then you've got the second Israel, which is the Israel of the imagination. Mm. And that Israel, in the words of Saul Bellow, is as broad as all of history and perhaps as deep as sleep. Mm. And that is the Israel of Christendom, I suppose, because Israel is the cornerstone of Christian civilization. Yes. And, you know, the, 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 the Christian... Uh, Bible mm. took the Jewish city and made it the holy city, mm. took the Jewish homeland and made it the holy land, and took a Jewish prophet and made him the son of God. And yet the Jews committed the ultimate betrayal of the chosen people, killed mm. the son of God. Mm. And then they were supplanted as the chosen people by the Christians. And this led to this sort of fetishization of Israel, whereby it simultaneously denigrated and elevated. Yes. It's, you know, the Jews were seen as the Untermenschen and the Ubermenschen, mm. you know, controlling the world because they're, they're, they're sort of warped, chosen people, 
uh, aura, but also uh, killing Christ, betrayal, yeah. Yeah. deviousness, devilishness. Yeah. Um, and that, that strange fixation on Israel, on the Israel of the imagination, has made it the repository mm. of fantasy. Mm. People project onto it their own politics, their own anxieties, their own fears, their own wish fulfillment. Mm. Um, and that's where Israelophobia uh, and anti-Semitism has always lodged itself. That's a very uh, in, uh, enlightening way of, of putting it, actually, because you know it seems to me that when people are Israelophobic, to use your term, um, they uh, are projecting also um, cultural self-loathing, I would say, um, and also usually a strong hatred of uh, the West and America. Yes, yes, it's part of, I mean, yeah. you're right, I mean, Israelophobia, because it's on the left, because mm. it's in Britain, it's largely on the left and the hard left. The harder you go, the harder it gets. Uh, mm. You know, it, it's, um, Israelophobia is, is one of a suite of, of what the American commentator Rob Henderson has called luxury beliefs. Yeah. Luxury yeah. beliefs. So, you know, views on, um, radical views on gender, on race, on slavery, on colonialism, on our history on Palestine, all come together in this package. And they're called luxury beliefs because they're not authentically held moral positions, but they're signal, signifiers mm. of social status. Mm. That's why you, you've got to have them all. You can't have, say, I, I love Israel, but I also am pro-trans. I mean, they, mm. they, they don't really go together very often, no, no. apart from it, you know, in rare occasions, um, apart from in Israel. Uh, no. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean, mm, they mm, tend to mm, go mm. together. And the people who, who hold that worldview uh, are called uh, um, by the uh, uh, a think tank, more, more in Britain? I forget the name of the think tank now. Sorry, I haven't had very much sleep the past. Before. No, 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 um, please. Uh, 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 described as, as radical activists, mm. progressive, prog uh, progressive activists. Mm. Constitutes about 13% of the population. Mm. They're highly university educated, wealthy, um, high levels of employ employability and employment um, occupy uh, the, the positions at the top of all of our institutions. Mm. Um, and, you know, from theatres and museums and galleries to the civil service, to um, local councils, to advertising agencies, to universities, mm. to schools actually mm. as well. And they use their positions of influence to cascade this ideology downwards. Mm. Um, creating a, 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 a culture now in which the tenor of society is, is set by the yeah. people at the top and they have successfully managed to place a sense of taboo around majority beliefs mm. on gender and other things. And Israel, Palestine is a part of that. Mm. Uh, and so wherever you find uh, institutions dominated by those elites, you tend, doesn't, you don't have to look very far before you find hatred of Jews. Yes. And also, what always strikes me is the unbelievable stupidity of that position. You know, essentially, I mean, it's beautifully summed up, when you're talking about luxury beliefs, beautifully summed up in that picture, it's actually a few years old now, but it's of an LGBTQ group holding up gays for Palestine. And you feel like saying, yeah, I'm a gay man, you feel like saying to them, do you have any idea how you would be treated? Yeah, I saw I saw a, a meme you know, that was going around yesterday with that that picture, yes. queers for Palestine, and beneath it was a picture saying chickens for KFC. That's right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Israel yeah. is the I believe the only country in that region which has a gay pride uh, festival, um, as well as being the bulwark of civilization. That's my putting my cards on the on the table. Um, in the context of what you've been telling me, when you see these demonstrations, and you may you made it quite clear that at the beginning that of course you know that there's nothing wrong in going to a Palestinian uh, demonstration, when these people have uh, you know placards up saying "Free Palestine," that's the very common one. What for people who are not so well versed necessarily in the politics, what are they asking to be free from? And indeed, you know. It, what it, can you just give us a little bit of background of that? And also, what do they really mean? Good question. Um, Sorry, you haven't had much sleep, as you said. Fine. No, 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 that's fine. Um, I mean, there are, there are two slogans that are most 
common. Yeah. Free Palestine, yeah. free, free Palestine. And from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Well, that means obliterate Israel, doesn't it? So the second one is basically an endorsement of the position of Hamas, yeah. uh, which is there's no space for Israel anywhere yeah. in the land. Yeah. So when somebody from that point of view says, we want to end the occupation, what they really mean is any presence of any uh, Israeli state. Mm -hmm. They see the whole thing as an occupation. Mm. Uh, and we saw that recently with the uh, terror attacks in Israel. They, are, they took place within Israel's internationally recognized borders. Mm. They didn't take place in any kind of controversial territory. Mm. Those are the borders set up by the United Nations mm. uh, until the present day. Israel did previously have a presence in Gaza, mm. but withdrew from there unilaterally in 2005. So Gaza is not... 2005? 2005. 2005. Mm. Gaza is not occupied. Mm. Israel withdrew. Mm. Israel withdrew, leaving behind functioning farms and infrastructure, which were then destroyed because they were felt to be tainted by some evil Jewishness. Mm. Um, so Gaza is not occupied. And there's this, there's this idea afoot that it is occupied because Israel seals the border, mm. uh, this blockade idea. Well, I think recent events have told us why that border has to be sealed. Mm. If they had an open border, it would be, mm. you know, a second Holocaust. Mm. Um, and, you know, that's just one of the ways in which social justice ideas are used to undermine Israel's attempts to defend its citizens. Yeah, yeah. Similarly with the the, the barrier on the West Bank between Isra Israeli civilians and Palestinian civilians. Mm. Before that barrier was constructed, there were suicide bombs almost weekly mm. in Israeli cities. You probably remember that mm. period. Mm. After it was built, those suicide bombs, to all intents and purposes, stopped. Mm. And that's what people are attacking as an apartheid wall. Take it down, it's an apartheid, it's an expression of apartheid. Mm. What, and have the suicide bombs? Mm. I don't like the barrier, but I like suicide bombs less. Mm. Um, so anyway, so, Free, so from the river to the sea, is an expression of uh, a desire for Israel's erasure. Um, free Palestine, um, I think, I mean, the, the, the controversy really, it, when you talk about occupation, it is on the West Bank. Mm. Um, uh, Gaza is on the uh, west, mm. the West Bank is on the east, it's, it's because it's the West Bank of the Jordan, which is further to the, right, right. To the, to the to, yeah, 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 to the east. Um, so uh, on the West Bank, and there are um, Jewish uh, Israeli towns and villages there, which are called settlements, derided as settlements. Um, and they sprung up in 1967, uh, and uh, during the Six Day, after the Six Day War. Mm. Uh, the Six Day War was the second time Israel faced a, a, a war of genocide against it. Mm. The first time was on the day it was established in 1947, 1948, the Arab armies, rather than accepting the partition plan, that was the first time the Arabs rejected a two-state solution, actually. The United, the United Nations offered them two states, they rejected it, waged war, <coughs> lost. Uh, 1967, they were building up to invade again. Uh, Israel waged war and beat them in, seven, in uh, six days mm. and took vast amounts of territory. Mm. Uh, took the entire Sinai. It took up almost until Beirut in the north. Uh, it took Gaza, it took the West Bank all the way up to the Jordan River. So it vastly expanded its territory. And almost all of that territory has been given back in exchange for peace. Mm. There's peace with Egypt, not a friendly peace, a cold peace, but a peace because the Sinai was returned to Egypt. Um, the majority of Syrian and Lebanese territory was returned, aside from the Golan Heights, which have strategic significance. They're mountainous and to give those back would be suicide, mm. just strategic su military suicide. Um, Gaza was, was given back even without a peace deal. Israel unilaterally mm. withdrew in 2005. Mm. The West Bank's where the problem is. Mm. The West Bank, um, uh, for, for, to, to Jews, has a range of significances, particularly to religious Jews, of, of which I am not one. Um, it has some ancient Jewish sites there, such as Hebron, which is the, that has the tomb of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their wives, for example. Um, it has some strategic significance, it has a mountain range in the middle of it, or, or higher ground in the middle of it, from which it's easy to launch missiles into Israeli population centers. Yeah. Um, uh, and the West Bank is a very, very complicated place. Yeah. That's what really what you could legitimately say is an occupation. 
Um, although I would qu that people query that as well. Mm -hmm. But that's where there's an argument to be had. Mm -hmm. um, and the, it, it, it used to be entirely under Israeli control after the Six Day War until the 90s when there were the Oslo Accords negotiations and, and agreements. Yep. Uh, at that time, the idea was to set the framework for a two-state solution to prepare the ground for that. Uh, Israel had a leftist prime minister, Yitzhak Rabin, Yasser Arafat was on the other side. They divided uh, through, with, with the UN's uh, oversight, divided the West Bank into areas A, B and C, uh, created a Palestinian authority, like a proto-government, in areas A and B, with its own security services, its own national anthem, its own law courts, uh, its own infrastructure, powers, and so forth. Uh, area C was under, and still is under, Israeli control, with some Palestinians living there, but the settlements are all there. Um, and so it, to call that an occupation is, mm. is complicated mm. because the Palestinians have autonomy mm -hmm. in, in those areas A and B. I mean, Israel can have security oversight, can go in and arrest people, mm. of course. Mm. There are checkpoints that, that are manned when necessary. Mm. But it's not an occupation like Tibet. You know, Tibet, in Tibet, it's Chinese. It's called China. You speak Tibetan, you, you, get, you get chucked in prison. You show the Tibetan flag, you get arrested and tortured. You can't... Uh, sing the Tibetan national anthem. You can't wish, wish the Dalai Lama a happy birthday. Yeah. That's a full mm. fat occupation. Mm. Israel's complicated. Mm. Um, you know, in 2008, uh, Ehud Olmert, the then Prime Minister of Israel, made an offer to the Palestinians, uh, which amounted to 100% of what they wanted. Uh, it, it offered uh, Israeli withdrawal from the old city of Jerusalem, mm. putting it under international control. It offered Israeli withdrawal from East Jerusalem, giving the Palestinians a capital in that part of the city. It offered um, Israeli uh, withdrawal from 96% of the West Bank, mm. with the remaining 4% made up in land swaps of other areas of Israel to give to Palestinians in return to make up the 100%. It offered a, um, a return of a quota of Palestinian refugees uh, yearly, yeah. with some financial compensation offered for the rest. It was what the Palestinians wanted. But in a grotesque failure of leadership, Mahmoud Abbas uh, uh, rejected it. This is the man who is now in the 18th year of his four-year term in office. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason was is Israelophobic. He couldn't accept having a Palestinian state alongside yep. an Israeli state rather than instead of. Mm. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's a general picture. And so when people say free Palestine, you could legitimately, I believe, say we want Israel off the West Bank to return to its... Uh, borders of 1948 or 19, pre-1967 borders. Mm -hmm. We don't think there should be any settlements uh, on the West Bank at all. Mm -hmm. We want to be free. We want to have our own state. You can legitimately make that argument without being Israelophobic. It's a perfectly reasonable position. Mm -hmm. um, but what? But the, the, it becomes a, 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 it ventriloquizes mm -hmm. um, Israelophobia mm -hmm. when what people really mean is we don't want Israelis anywhere. Yes, exactly. When you actually you referred there to two-party solute, uh, two-state solution, um, you know, fact is this is dead in the water, isn't it now? This idea. I mean, yeah. you still hear it rehearsed. I think was it David Lammy was saying something about it. I think this week. Yeah. It's it's quite infuriating, really. Solution. I mean, people, you know, they sort of haven't updated their intellectual software yeah. since since the, the uh, Clinton years. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem is that if not the two-state solution, then what? Mm. And nobody has an answer to that. Mm. And it's much easier to say we want a two-state solution. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's not wrong. It's just impossible. Mm. 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 Um, you know, to have a secure and prosperous... Well, it's Palestine, been turned down. I mean, it's been turned down numerous times. Yeah, yeah. But to have a secure and prosperous Palestine alongside mm. a secure and prosperous Israel would be wonderful. Mm. I mean, mm. nobody would... I think very few people mm. would oppose that. Mm. Um, around the world. Um, but, you know, at the moment, it's, it's more distant than ever because you've got on, in, in Gaza, it's ruled by Hamas, uh, which are, as we've seen, the same as ISIS. In fact, they share a common ideological route in the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. um, on the West Bank, you have Abbas, who's re who rejected the 2008 mm -hmm. deal, um, who, is, as I said, you know, uh, outstayed his welcome by 14 years without an election. Uh, the, the, the regime there is, is deeply corrupt, mm. thriving on aid money, or at least the people at the top are thriving on aid money. Mm. Um, brutal, mm. 
there was a, a year or two ago, there was a democracy campaigner on the West Bank, Palestinian, called uh, Nizar Banat, uh, who became a threat to the leadership because he was quite popular. Mm. He was kidnapped by the security services and beaten to death. It's brutal. Mm. You know, on the West Bank, there are, there's, a, there's a hospital built by aid money, I believe, from Italy, state-of-the-art hospital, that's a ghost hospital. Nobody uses it because yes. the officials take backhanders to direct them to other hospitals. Yes, yeah. uh, it's all cronyism. Yeah. Um, so that's the state of life there. Mm. So to suggest that Israel could, and, uh, and also Mahmoud Abbas, the permanent president of Palestine, the Palestinian Authority, mm. supported the terror attacks mm. last week, saying they were active resistance. Yes. Mm. Uh, and, and actually um, incited uh, violence on the West Bank as well. So to suggest that there's any hope of a, a meaningful dialogue for peace mm. is quite obviously absurd. Yes. And what I'm not saying is that all Palestinians are like that. Um, perish the thought. Uh, Azar Banat, Banat is one example of a, a, a very decent Palestinian. And I, I know some Palestinians, and they're Palestinians who've stood up against Israelophobia. Um, there are, you know, lot, I'm not saying that because they're Palestinian, they're doomed to be like that. Mm -hmm. They're not mm -hmm. uh, at all. But uh, at the moment, the, you know, the two-state solution seems like an absolute pipe dream. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in my view. The, uh, the only possible way forward, not now in the midst of war, but in the medium term, um, is, a, is, a, is an approach which was epitomised by Naftali Bennett, the last Prime Minister before his government collapsed and Netanyahu came in. Uh, I was, sort of interviewed him just last week. Um, and he had this concept, which was taken, by, taken from the public intellectual Mika Goodman in, in Israel, of shrinking the conflict, which is pragmatic. So rather than having a grand plan for a two-state solution, you just try to make things a bit easier for people mm. wherever you can. Mm. Fewer checkpoints if they're, if, you know, if they're not needed, um, easing some security restrictions when they're not needed, allowing a bit more passage into Jordan maybe for Palestinians when, it, when, it's, when it's safe to do so, that sort of thing. Mm. The, prin the principle he had was that 70% of people agree on 70% of the issues. So rather than focus on the 30% that everyone disagrees on, Let's find where we can agree on step one, even if mm. we wouldn't agree with the ultimate ideology, mm. and do that. And mm. that's confidence building, um, and uh, and can begin to find some common ground that maybe one day can build to a position where peace negotiations are possible. But even this sounds absurd. I'm saying it; it sounds outdated mm. by mm. by the current events. Mm. I mean, obviously, if we were doing this interview a week today, good look, good heaven knows where we're going to actually be next week. Um, you you mentioned in, in the title of your book here, the newest version of the oldest hatred, which you've explained to us, and what to do about it. I, I, I take from what you were just saying there that that's sort of some of the things maybe that you would uh, put in there. But what, what broadly, I say what to do about it, what, what would you do about it? Well, I mean, what to do about it, um, that, that part of the book, uh, it's not about how to solve Middle East Yes, yes exactly. I, I'm not talking yes. about that. I'm talking about the debate around yeah. <clears throat> around it, and I'm talking about <clears throat> how to um, how to uh, push back against Israelophobic narratives that are mm -hmm. almost in the air that we breathe sometimes. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and I think really uh, the material in the book arms people with enough arguments and facts yeah. and history to have the capacity to pierce the. Uh, illusion mm. that people are trying to create of this genocidal apartheid white supremacist state. Can I ask you with this um, it, the, this material? You know that you're you, you know you're equipping people really with the with the truth. Here. But would you be invited? Would you get a platform at universities to talk about your book, for example? I haven't yet. Uh, I mean, it's a point, isn't it? It's a sort of book that would be you would be talking. About, I mean, if you know, if you were another author, if it wasn't about, yeah, Israel. I mean, look, you know, universities are, as you've said, hotbeds of Israelophobia, and uh, whenever an Israeli official goes to visit uh, a university, mm. almost always they're shouted down and, and have to flee. Mm. I mean, there are those mm. disgraceful scenes of the ambassador Zippy Hotovelli 
about two years ago in, I believe it was in Cambridge. Mm. Um, there was that video of her having to sprint yes, out of the door right. to her yeah. car and mm -hmm. then and drive away at speed with a mob in pursuit. Mm. Um, so, you know, w would I go to university to speak? Absolutely. Have I been invited? No. No. And finally, look, you, you were on question time last night, weren't mm -hmm. you? Um, quite a big argument, which in the context of what's happening might seem very trivial, right? but in terms of response is this thing about the BBC and this kind of not, them not, not using the word terrorist to describe Hamas, calling them fighters or militants, even when the king, I'm going to say, has used the word terrorism. You know, the Prince and Princess of Wales have used terrorism. Um, what's your view on it? Do you, I mean, basically, are you... It's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. The, you know, I, the, I understand their arguments and they're not, they don't stand up to scrutiny. Mm. Um, you know, the BBC, regardless of its guidelines, has called ISIS terrorists, mm. the IRA terrorists, mm. Al-Qaeda terrorists. Why not Hamas? Mm, mm. Hamas's brutality is equal to ISIS. Mm. Its ideology is the same. They share an ideological root in the Muslim Brotherhood, mm. which actually was informed by Nazism. Mm. And we can go into that history in my book. Mm. Um, this is the Grand Mufti, isn't it? Uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back uh, in the 30s, actually. 20s 30s, 30s. And 40s. Well, it was during the war. Yeah. We met, met Hitler and, yeah. and collaborated to mm. spread Nazi propaganda into the Arab world. Yes. Uh, which then became the Muslim Brotherhood, which then became. Um, Hamas, Al-Qaeda and mm. ISIS. In fact, Hamas, if you look at the Hamas Charter, Article 32 accuses the Zionists of wishing to take over the entire Middle East from the Euphrates to the Nile. Mm. And it says, and we know they want to do this from the protocols of the elders of Zion. Mm. That is Nazi ideology. That's not like or similar to. Mm. That is yes, Nazism. Exactly. That mm. is Nazism. Yeah. Um, you know, the 9-11 attacks by Al-Qaeda, the Hamburg trials of the surviving members of the cell mm. established that, his motive, that their motivation was anti-Semitic. Mm. They attacked the Twin Towers in New York because they saw them as uh, the center of Jewish power. Um, it's all part of the same thing. Yes. In fact, they found an ISIS flag in Gaza just today, I think. Really? Um, so, uh, amongst the debris. So, yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, it is uh, infuriating, and I, I think I would just end, as I get the sense that we're coming to an end now, although you can ask me another question no, if you, no, if you no, would no, like no, to, no. but the, 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 the things we were talking about earlier, about the presence of sympathy for Hamas uh, in Britain, mm. and the way in which it's part of these luxury beliefs and part of the uh, elites, uh, this sort of suite of, of, of views, on gender and race and Palestine and so forth. Um, you know, all of the, 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 the struggle with that ideology is commonly derided as being culture wars. Mm. I feel strongly in the wake of these attacks and given the shameful scenes in Britain mm. of support for it, that those wars really matter mm. because they're related to the real wars. Mm. They relate, you know. There's a there's a relationship. There's a connection. There's a, there's a uh, there's a seamlessness mm. between the brutality and savagery that's taking place in Israel mm. and the useful idiots here who support mm. it. Well, this is an attack on civilization, as I would right. actually say. Yeah? Mm. Well, look, Jake, thank you so much for making the time um, and. Um, very important that we spoke about it this week. Mm. Um, this book, which has been out as I said from September, uh, Israelophobia, uh, the newest version of the oldest hatred and what to do about it. It's, it's been obviously uh, in bookstores and Amazon and all the rest. It's not displayed very prominently in bookstores. I wonder why that could be. Yeah, but it's it's, it's, funny, it's, it's funny, that Waterstones it's maybe? A, I mean, um, you know. It is there, but you have to look for it. Um, <laughs> no, but yeah, it but it's, it's on Amazon either. anyway. But thank you very, very much for coming in. Thank you thank very you. much indeed, yeah. Jay. Um, there we are. And uh, we shall see you next week. So uh, have a good week in the meantime. Bye. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. 
Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.